Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Ashley, and, and thank you, Hannah, and thanks everybody for um, uh, organizing uh, this fourth MMT conference, this time virtually. Uh, hopefully next year we'll be gathering in person uh, somewhere to, to celebrate MMT and the public policy work that uh, many of you here in the in the audience uh, have been doing on the on the grassroots levels and, and the candidates who are running for office. So today's uh, panel, uh, I have the pleasure of, of hosting this discussion on MMT and running for office. Um, my name is Fadel Kaboub. I teach economics at Denison University, and I'm the president of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to host this conversation uh, with us uh, right now uh, on uh, this call uh, are both Stephanie Gallardo uh, uh, from uh, Washington State uh, and Neil uh, Walia uh, from uh, Colorado, and we'll be joined hopefully in a, in a few minutes uh, with two more candidates uh, that I'll introduce. So um, I thought we should uh, start sort of the conversation by uh, allowing our guests to introduce themselves and kind of tell us a little bit about themselves and, and their campaigns. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and do the, the, the quick short introduction. Uh, we'll start with with Stephanie, and then we'll we'll go to to Neil. And if uh, uh, the other candidates join us, hopefully in the next couple of minutes, we'll be able to uh, add them to the conversation. Um, so, starting with Stephanie, Stephanie Gallardo was born and raised on the unceded traditional lands of the Duwamish uh, and Coast Salish people, also known as Seattle. Uh, for the past decade, she has uh, had the privilege of being an educator in the south end of Seattle. Uh, in her second year of classroom teaching, she was elected to the board of directors of the largest labor union in the country, the National Education Association. Stephanie takes pride in her roots, culture, and community. She is the daughter of a Chilean refugee, Mexican farm, farm workers, educators, and poets. Her family legacy serves as her primary motivation to ensure that every person, particularly those who are dispossessed by state violence, received swift justice. Without any further ado, Stephanie, the floor is yours. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, plug in the, Stephanie's campaign in the chat. Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaboob. I just want to just shout you out, first of all, because I have just been such a um, you know, I don't want to say fan because I don't like to idolize people, but at the same time, I'm a huge fan. I have to be real. <laughs> so I'm um, just thank you so much uh, for having me thank here. You. Really excited to be here. Um, so, yeah, my name is Stephanie Gallardo. I am a former high school history teacher. I left my teaching job actually to uh, do this campaign, and that was at the end of June of 2021. Um, so it's almost a year now that I've been out of the classroom and focusing full time on the campaign. And, um, you know, the reason that I decided to run for Congress is because um, as an educator, I feel like I've finally been able to see that our uh, government is really not meeting the needs of our communities. And I saw that every single day um, in my classroom, young people um, coming without the necessities because not only can their parents not provide, but our school cannot provide for them. And um, so this, this uh, you know, concept and understanding of the economy um, is also new to me. And so I'm really excited um, to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, my family, my father's family is originally from Chile, and uh, they arrived here to the Seattle area as refugees um, following the coup um, that the U.S. Um, sponsored um, and really led um, in Chile. And, um, you know, growing up from a community of refugees who really held me down um, and pushed me in a lot of different ways, um, it was a really beautiful experience and it was also really challenging and it really gives me a little bit of insight into what the other folks in my community which is largely an immigrant and refugee community um, are experiencing right now um, especially in the political context that we have and so um, i'm here you know to to really hold it down for the people and to shine a light on um, what we're actually going through on the ground because i feel that most of our politicians um, don't go through those experiences right they have 
uh, generational wealth to fall back on. They have power that they're happy to wield. Um, and I simply don't come from, you know, that pedigree. And it's time that people like us um, really step up into these positions um, and start throwing around the weight of community, community power. And so um, that's just a little bit about me and really excited to be here again. I'm sure I'll tell more along the way throughout this session. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, next, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Neil uh, Walia. Uh, Neil uh, is the son of immigrants who came to this country from India in pursuit of better opportunities uh, for their children and their families. Neil grew up hearing of the journey of his parents from their beginnings as service industry workers to their current careers as educators, teaching him what is possible when all people are given the opportunity to succeed. Neil is running for Congress in the first congressional district in, in Colorado. Uh, in his time at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, Neil got involved in campus organizing as the president of the South Asian Student Association and was elected to serve in the university's student government. Through an internship with former governor Mark Udall, Neil was able to get his first foot in the door of politics. Neil brought his passion for public service to the to governor uh, Hickenlooper's office, uh, working to end homelessness in Colorado and build bridges between the state government and the AAPI community. Uh, this work brought him to Washington, D.C. with the National Governors Association, which opened his eyes to the underside of the national politics. Neil realized, just, uh, realized that just being a Democrat wasn't enough to fight for justice and equity that both parties are influenced by special interest groups, corporate lobbyists, and massive amounts of money, uh, all to maintain the status quo instead of creating a better country for all Americans. Neil was committed, has committed himself to uh, fight not just for the Democratic Party, but for the people who've been left behind by politicians across the spectrum. Uh, Neil, without any further ado, uh, the floor is yours, and I'm going to go ahead and plug the link to your website in the chat. Neil. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, and uh, thank you to uh, not only Dr. Uh, Kaboob, but like the entire MMT community. Uh, this community invested in me when I had nothing, and I'm proud to say that I recently qualified for the ballot, uh, and I'm now one-on-one -on -one with my opponent going into the uh, June Democratic primary. And so... I'm happy to be here with you all. Uh, as Fedel said, my name is Neil Walia. Uh, I'm running for Congress in Colorado's first congressional district in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I think the best way to tell you all about myself is to share a story uh, about my parents who are from India, as Fadel mentioned. Um, you know, when I was 13 years old, my parents decided to take me and my sister over to Delhi um, to visit extended family. And one afternoon, uh, they took us out into a bazaar. And for those of you who are familiar with India, you know, you can picture what a bazaar looks like. We're talking about dirt roads. We're talking about stores on your left, stores on your right, tens and thousands of people as far as your eyes can see. And we were making our way through a crowd one afternoon where we happened to stumble upon this young boy. Now, this young boy happened to be the same age as I was, uh, same skin color, same haircut, same eyes. And yet here this young man was absolutely begging for his life without a single piece of clothing on his body. And I remember asking myself in that moment, how is it possible that this person, the same age as me, from the same country of origin, the same heritage, has absolutely nothing, yet I get to go home every single night to a roof over my head, to clothes on my back, and warm food in my belly. You know, I've never stopped thinking about that young boy. And the real tragedy of the story that I'm telling you right now is that that young man's story is now happening right here in Denver, Colorado. And that reality is what my parents escaped from to come to this country in pursuit of what was known as the American dream. And like my parents, I've taken all of the steps that I've been told that would allow me to build a better life for me and my loved ones. I'm fortunate enough to have gone to graduate school here in Denver. I have two master's degrees. Uh, I taught students for a number of years that allowed me to get a, a job with the former governor of our state. And as Fedel said, that took me out to Washington, D.C., where I spent a handful of years of my career working in and out of the halls of Congress on Capitol Hill. And yet, in spite of taking all of these steps, I now feel like my life is more vulnerable than it's ever felt. I'm being crushed by a lifetime of student debt, 
can't afford to buy a home in the city that I love. Cost of childcare is something that is actively delaying my ability to begin my family with my wife. And now my parents, my dad is 70, my mom is in her mid sixties. They're both public school teachers here in Colorado. They've actively delayed their retirement, not only because of their own economic insecurity, but because they're asking themselves the same question that so many other people in their generation are asking, which is, do I still have a role left to play in shaping the future of my kids, my grandkids and future generations in this country? And really it was feeling all of these pressures in my own life and knowing that there are millions and millions of Americans all over this country who are going through the same thing that I'm going through. That's why I decided to run for Congress. Our communities deserve to have a representative who's not only living their struggles, but will have to fight to fix them as if their lives depended on it. Uh, and my life does. And as I mentioned earlier, we just qualified uh, for the June Democratic primary. I'm one on one with my opponent without a Republican challenger, meaning when I win the primary in June, I'll become the first person of color in the history of this district to ever represent our communities in the halls of Congress. But more importantly, I will be the only federal representative in this entire state who has never accepted and never will accept corporate PAC money. Denver has long been ready to be a leading voice in the movement for a Green New Deal, healthcare as a human right, and housing for all. And we're looking forward to making history this June uh, and taking our communities to the next level once we're in Congress. So uh, thank you all again for letting me be here with you today, and I'm excited to have a discussion with you all. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, and I have the pleasure here of welcoming uh, our next candidate, Maud Terzi, uh, who is a, a Democrat running for the U.S. House of uh, Representatives to represent the people of the state of uh, Connecticut, the first district. Maud is a son of uh, uh, Libyan asylum seekers and a former policy advisor to U.S. Senator Chris Murphy. Uh, he is focused on getting corporate money out of politics so that we can create a more just America and world. Uh, and I have the pleasure here of plugging in the link uh, to Moad's campaign. Uh, Moad, the, the floor is yours. Welcome. Uh, and you might be on mute or your mic is not um, working. Uh, there's a, a little microphone speaker symbol at the bottom. If you click on it to turn it off and then turn it back on, choose the microphone option, not the headset option. I don't know if the setting is different from a phone versus a laptop. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, great, great. I uh, will so apologize for running late. It's uh, Ramadan and uh, things uh, can get super busy on the campaign trail. So as you can see, I'm taking this me from my car. Mubarak. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm guessing we're, we're just doing an introduction of, of who we are and, uh, yes. and how we decided to run. So my, my name is Muad. I'm running for Connecticut's first congressional district, which is Hartford in the greater Hartford area. Uh, and uh, I think all three of us candidates are, are a bit on the younger side. And usually when I tell people I'm running for Congress, uh, their first reaction is, you know, how old are you and, and why are you doing this at such a young age? And I, I think it's a terrific question. You know, wh why why spend my, my 20s uh, running for Congress? Uh, and to me, honestly, it's, it's that. I fear there might not be a future uh, left fighting for if good people don't get involved now. Uh, we have so many crises that we're facing from uh, climate crisis to the backsliding of our democracy uh, to potential nuclear annihilation at this point. Uh, and so uh, I think now is definitely the time for, for people to get involved of all generations, of all ages. Uh, but my story begins with my parents who came to this country, uh, as you mentioned, as asylum seekers fleeing persecution in Libya. Uh, and they came here because they wanted to uh, enjoy the basic liberties that all humans should have access to, as well as uh, the ability to prosper and, and have a better future for their kids. And so my father started off parking cars as a valet and my mom was a substitute teacher and a homemaker. Uh, and uh, they worked hard for 20 years and eventually were able to achieve uh, the pinnacle of the American dream, which is uh, buying a house. And so we lived in this house for about eight years, uh, made a lot of cherished memories, and uh, we really enjoyed being able to, to call a place our home. Uh, but then the Great Recession of 2008 happened, and my father had his pace slashed. Uh, we were just thankful that uh, he still had a job because some people lost their job during that time. Uh, but a few weeks later, 
he realized that we can no longer afford our house and we had to foreclose on it, uh, which as you can imagine is a very uh, tumultuous process and very disruptive to any family's life. And so my mom taking care of myself and, and my five siblings uh, wasn't paying attention to her own health. And she got extremely sick and we rushed her to the emergency room. Uh, thankfully, uh, we saved her life. They had an emergency kidney procedure. Uh, but a few weeks later after that, we get $20,000 of medical debt uh, during this economic crisis. Uh, as you can imagine, we couldn't afford $20,000, uh, especially after losing our house. And I wish the story stopped there. But then I myself, as a 17-year-old, went to that same exact uh, emergency room. And uh, instead of being uh, you know, rushed to treatment, I was rushed to the billing desk. Uh, I was asked about my insurance, uh, whether I could pay off this medical debt that I had no idea existed. Uh, my parents never told me about it because I was just 17. But I told them I couldn't, you know, pay for it. And then they started asking if I could set up a payment plan, uh, walk me through these series of questions, literally while I was gasping for air, uh, sitting down uh, with pneumonia in my lungs. And when I told them I couldn't you know, pay any of it off, they asked me to wait in the waiting room for over an hour until I finally collapsed. Uh, at that moment, I realized something was deeply, deeply wrong with our country, uh, that in the world's wealthiest country, we were allowing 17 year olds to nearly perish because of medical debt, uh, that we were allowing young people uh, to, to essentially be uh, targeted by a healthcare system uh, because we were too poor to afford care. Uh, and so uh, at that moment, I was uh, you know, fearful that I might actually uh, die, but I, I was convinced that if I lived, uh, my job was to try to figure out what had gone wrong, what had gone awry in our healthcare system. And so uh, that eventually led me to work for, for Chris Murphy as a health policy advisor. Um, and I was always concerned that maybe my family did something wrong and you know, maybe there was something we could have done differently. Uh, the older I got, the more I realized uh, it wasn't just my family that had gone through these crises and was experiencing these crises, but it was so many Americans that uh, had gone through similar challenges and still go through similar challenges uh, in that uh, we see crisis from crisis, uh, whether it's the student debt crisis, whether it's the climate catastrophe, whether it's the fact that seniors can't retire dignity. Uh, it just felt like there was an overwhelming series of crises that were happening uh, all over uh, our, our economy, our sectors, different generations, different areas. And so uh, I was curious as to why that happened. And, uh, the more time I spent in Washington, uh, the more it became uh, abundantly clear that corporate money had uh, taken over our government and is dominating what happens. Uh, it's clear as day. Uh, so as a health policy advisor trying to bring down pharmaceutical prices, I would oftentimes be confronted by pharmaceutical lobbyists who were doing the exact opposite, spending millions, if not billions of dollars uh, to keep prices high. Uh, and so the question was, how do we change this, in my opinion? And you know, that, that to me seemed like the most obvious question to be asking. Uh, and uh, I believe we have to start with electing officials who don't take any corporate money. And so that, that is uh, something that uh, I have uh, been working hard on, uh, as well as my two fellow candidates. And it's not easy. Uh, the system is designed uh, to challenge us to make this almost impossible. But uh, I believe we're fighting for democracy. Uh, I believe we're fighting for the very reason my parents came to this country. Uh, so uh, to me, this is, uh, uh, we have to save the entire uh, uh, governance system that will allow us to hopefully unlock the power and deliver on uh, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, livable wage, all of these things. Uh, and so uh, that that is the thing that has been driving me to do this. Uh, and that's, that's a bit about me and, and why I'm running. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so uh, Rick just emailed me and I sent him the link to log in. So hopefully he'll be joining us in, in the next uh, few minutes. Maybe uh, Ashley or, or Hannah can uh, work with him to help him uh, log in properly. But I sent him the link. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd love to start the conversation with uh, just a handful of questions that I've prepared here, uh, two or three questions related to your campaigns and running for office in general and MMT, kind of the policy framework. Uh, and then we'll open it up and, and grab some questions from, from the chat and, and, and engage in a conversation. So the, the first uh, question I have for you is, how did you come across MMT and, and can you tell us in, in what ways uh, it informs your economic policy platform uh, just for the benefits of the audience and, and other people in the audience who might be considering a run for office or thinking about running for office or some are uh, working on other campaigns. Uh, this is really uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to hear from you, the candidates, uh, how you came across MMT and how it, uh, it applies in, in the context of your campaign. So we'll start with with, with the same uh, in the same order. We'll start with Stephanie. Absolutely. Um, I actually love the story of how I came across MMT. Um, so I had not yet decided to run for Congress um, when I discovered MMT, 
And, um, but I was thinking about it, right? I was thinking, you know, what, what can I do? What are the next steps that I can take in order to create serious change in my community? And so, um, you know, one big area that um, has always been very challenging for me and very difficult for me to understand um, is economic policy. In fact, I remember specifically the economics classes that I took in college. I hated them. I could not stand them. And I just, I, I couldn't understand. It, it felt like people were speaking a different language to me, to be honest with you. And I'm multilingual, so I know how to understand language. Do you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so um, what I did was I started to kind of look up online um, ways that I can understand the economy better. And I came across Dr. Kaboob's um, YouTube videos and I started watching them and I just, I, I literally was up all night um, laying in the bed right next to my husband, watching these YouTube videos with my headphones on. And I was just, I, I, I was excited because for the first time in my life, I was actually understanding um, the way somebody was presenting an economic model to me or economic understanding um, of the world we live in. And so for me, it felt, it felt very exciting. Um, and then um, I see him also in here. I'm going to shout him out. Hi, Randy. Uh, and then I was introduced to Randy Mandel and um, he basically gave me a rundown of MMT and he um, really, really introduced me um, to understanding MMT better. And then of course I read um, uh, Stephanie Kelton's book. And so I kind of just started on the track and um, really, really progressed with it. And, um, you know, Randy and I talked about all different ideas um, about bringing uh, this conversation to our communities and those conversations are still developing. Um, and it's definitely something that I want to bring to my community in multiple different languages, because um, here in the 9th Congressional District in Washington State, we have hundreds of different of lang different languages um, because we are an immigrant and refugee community. And this is something that the people need to hear. They need to understand uh, because I feel like we've been taught a version of economic policy our entire lives um, that is not only incorrect, um, but it's totally inaccessible for the people. And so um, that's sort of how I, you know, entered into the conversations of MMT. And now it's really just blown up my understanding of how um, economic policy affects each aspect of my campaign platform. Um, it's, it's definitely still a growing understanding. And I will be the first to tell you that I'm no MMT expert, um, but I am ready to continue in these conversations. Um, and really bring it to a level um, where our communities are being impacted, um, not only through these conversations, but through economic policies that are gonna support our, our communities on the ground. Um, so I'll stop there and I'll let my, my colleagues jump in. Wonderful. Uh, before I, I come to you, Neil, uh, I'm trying to help uh, Rick. Uh, Rick is with us, but he's trying to connect the audio. Rick, if you're hearing me, you'll look at the bottom of your uh, screen, you'll see uh, blue icons, one of them, looks like a, a microphone, uh, click on it to turn it off and then click on it again to turn it back on. And then it will give you an option for a headset or a microphone. Choose the microphone so you can turn your microphone on uh, and then click on the camera icon and turn on your camera if you're able to do that so you can join us. Um, uh, if not, I think Hannah is also texting you in the chat. So uh, take a look at her instructions as well. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll connect with you in, uh, in a minute. Uh, but uh, Neil, go ahead and tell us what's, you know, how, how did you come across MMT and, and tell us in what ways it, it informs your public policy platform uh, for your yeah. campaign? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, so I announced my campaign in July of last year, but I started exploring the prospect of running for Congress uh, in January of last year. And so uh, as I was exploring, thankfully, some deep rooted relationships with people uh, I had both working here in Colorado, as well as out in DC, people who are very much a part uh, of kind of the Sanders camp, the AOC camp. Uh, they started kind of hearing about my you know, journey here, trying to kind of figure out if I have the ability to challenge our 25 year sitting representative. Um, and I was very vocal about one key priority that I'm hoping to achieve when I'm elected into office, which is uh, to elevate the housing crisis and the homeless crisis 
to a national priority and ultimately end homelessness in the United States of America. That is my goal when I am elected into office. That is what I want to achieve. And I want to turn Colorado's first congressional district into the national bully pulpit on that issue. And so a couple months of my exploration go by and uh, one of my friends uh, who is, you know, good friends with a lot of uh, MMT experts says, all right, like I'm going to put you down uh, in a conversation with a handful of experts uh, who are familiar not only with like deep rooted social transformational policy, uh, but also are experts in the field of modern money theory, modern monetary theory. Uh, and that was honestly the first time I had heard about MMT. And so uh, all of a sudden I find myself uh, being scheduled uh, for a number of calls with people I would normally have no business talking to uh, on any given Sunday. I had a chat with, you know, not only Fedel, but people like Dr. Stephanie Kelton, people like Pavlina Javerna, uh, Rohan Gray, Andres Bernal. And what I realized when these meetings were scheduled that these people were like way above uh, the league of individuals I was typically talking to. And so uh, in order to not make a total fool out of myself in these conversations, uh, I deep dive into MMT. I start watching every single lecture. Uh, I start watching videos. I start reading up uh, not only on the deficit myth, which is one of Dr. Stephanie Kelton's book, but also the case for a federal job guarantee, uh, which is championed by Pavlina. And, uh, you know, we have these conversations and uh, thankfully, I think we all aligned on our priority and our vision for what is possible and what we want to achieve. And so MMT uh, has been a guiding framework uh, for my vision to end homelessness in the United States of America. And for me, that is in the trifecta of uh, passing a homes guarantee, major federal investments, uh, not only into permanent supportive housing, but affordable housing all over the United States of America. We need to also couple that with healthcare as a human right. Uh, and then finally, uh, through the Green New Deal, coupled with a federal jobs guarantee, uh, that is how we can transform this country from the bottom up and empower working class and middle class Americans all over the United States of America. And so on the campaign trail, what MMT has given me the ability to do uh, is to focus, as Stephanie said, on the economics of social progressive policy. And I think this was something that I had found myself challenged by, uh, which is falling into the same weaponized traps that I think uh, people who uh, think more along the lines of kind of like that capitalist model of economics, the thing that we've all been taught growing up in this country. The one question that we as progressives seem to get over and over and over again, which is, well, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for housing? How are you going to pay uh, for healthcare as a human right? How are you going to pay for a Green New Deal? And really what this has allowed me to do is overcome that challenge because what we understand is that the federal budget uh, is a construct and that we can actually finance every major social progressive policy vision uh, that all of us want to see happen in this country. We never seem to ask that question of how do you pay for it when, let's say, we finance a 20-year war uh, like we did in 2001. Uh, we never asked that question when the banking industry melted down the economy in 2008 and we bailed them out. We didn't ask about how are we going to pay uh, for COVID? How are we going to make sure that Americans are safe and stay home? You know, as a country, whenever we've treated anything as a national priority, we have always made the choice to finance it. Uh, and now it's time for us to kind of pivot that framework and now elevate things like healthcare, things like the Green New Deal and the environment things like housing up to a national priority level. And I think once we're able to do that with sound strategic policy, uh, I think we will have, uh, you know, the nation that we all want to see uh, materialize in this country. And so MMT is not exactly something I talk about in and of itself, but it is the framework that allows me uh, to make people believe uh, that a better world is possible, that there is economic value uh, in the policies that we all care about. Uh, and that has really, I think, inspired a lot of people uh, on the campaign trail to really buy into the vision that we're trying to champion. And so um, it has been uh, one of the most important frameworks, I would say, uh, in allowing me to articulate the need for deep-rooted social transformation on the campaign trail. And the thing that really makes me like proud about MMT is that 
it's reshifting the culture of politics to talk about what we all need to be talking about, which is solutions. It's policy, right? I think we all recognize that politics in large part has become a culture war and we're getting attached to dialogues that are uh, not really focused on the community, not really focused on how can we actually make change in this country. Uh, we're focused on theater at the moment, but what MMT is giving us the ability to do is reshift the paradigm, refocus what we need to refocus this movement on, which is solutions. And I think the more and more candidates buy into the MMT movement, the more we'll see that transformation continue to take place. And so if you're listening to this and if you're thinking about running for office and want to champion a progressive vision, uh, I implore you, read up on MMT. You have to couple MMT with every single policy that you want to advocate. And I promise you, it will, it will empower you in a way that I think uh, I really wasn't expecting when I started kind of embracing this culture and framework. Wonderful. Thank you, Neil. Uh, uh, Moad, can you uh, tell us your experience? How did you come across MMT and, and in what ways uh, does it inform your economic policy platform? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I don't remember when I first uh, heard of MMT, but it was definitely during Bernie's campaign. Um, but when I really uh, became invested in it is uh, after reading Stephanie Kelton's book. Uh, that's that's when I kind of uh, really uncovered the full power of MMT and how uh, it, it could empower me as a candidate. Uh, so the way it's been useful to me uh, is that uh, I've always uh, I've always believed in policies like Medicare for all, uh, Green New Deal. Uh, but I'm not going to lie, the, you know, the kind of the, the model where we might overspend that deficit spending is bad. Uh, that, that definitely uh, is influential, even in the way that I thought before. And so uh, I wanted to be a responsible advocate for policies, but I was concerned maybe there was some truth that could we actually afford some of these things. What MMT did is uh, give me full confidence that absolutely we can afford these things, uh, provided me with an economic paradigm that not only makes sense, uh, but also gives us the ability to to really invest in the American people uh, and really invest in our planet, and our environment, and uh, be able to, to, with confidence, advocate for, for policies that we, we definitely need. Uh, so it's been immensely useful that way. Uh, and uh, I really also, I, I don't typically even get into the, the nuances of it on the campaign trail, but it's just the, the ability for me to advocate for these policies, uh, knowing that, um, you know, we, we've done things like uh, finance 20, or like Neil said, and uh, bailout banks, uh, you know, with the press of a button, uh, and we can do the same thing for uh, policies that will help all of us, like Medicare for All and Green New Deal. Wonderful. Uh, I'm trying to check in on, on Rick. Rick, are you able to turn on your mic and camera? I see you're here. Um, Rick, if you, if you try to, um, uh, look at the bottom of your screen. There's uh, those blue icons. Uh, there's a camera icon. Try to turn it on. And then the mic icon, you might have to turn it off and then turn it back on uh, and select the microphone instead of the headset uh, to uh, to join us. So I'll, um, uh, as you're able to do that, you can text me in the chat and I'll bring you uh, on board. Um, the next question I, I have for you are, uh, what are some of the most challenging questions or pushback you get from uh, constituents about your economic policy proposals? And as, and as Neil said, it's, you know, how do you pay for it, right? And, and how do you address these questions? Because we're, in a way, we're, we're engaged in a, in a massive public education campaign uh, to demonstrate that what we've been, you know, taught for for generations that governments are limited by tax revenues or borrowing capacity, MMT is demonstrating that we can actually afford a lot of the policy ideas you have on your on your platform without bankrupting the country, without causing hyperinflation, without uh, going into a, a slippery uh, slope into a, a chaotic economic system. Uh, MMT demonstrates that these things are within reach and we can manage the risk of inflation. We can democratize the economy and, and so on. And I, and I uh, see that Rick is, uh, is with us here. Rick, uh, uh, are you able to uh, turn on your microphone? Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Perfect. So let me, let right. me introduce you. Thank you, for, 
No problem. Thank you for for joining us. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and do a quick introduction and give you a minute to uh, uh, to tell us uh, a little bit about your your campaign and and what uh, motivated you uh, to run. Uh, and then we'll uh, I'll catch you up on some of the questions that we've been discussing. Kind of what brought you to how you discovered MMT and how it informs your policy uh, framework. So Rick Devoy owns a, a bookstore in Red Wing, Minnesota. Uh, he has uh, long been a student of the history and science of money. He understands MMT and the dynamics of sovereign currency. He has been involved in grassroots politics all of his life and has campaign managed several times. He was the director of the campaign for a common good economy, which was an effort to charter a democratically owned bank that would feature its own currency. He is currently running in the Democratic primary in uh, Minnesota, the first congressional district, uh, which is considered one of the 35 competitive uh, districts remaining after the redistricting uh, in the state. Mainstreaming MMT is one of the primary reasons he chose to run, seeing it as uh, essential to answering the inevitable pay for question. He understands that if we have the votes, we have the money. And I'll have the pleasure of plugging here the link to uh, Rick's campaign. Uh, Rick, the floor is yours. Welcome. Okay, great. Uh, it's great to be among you. Absolutely wonderful uh, to be among folks who who get it uh, and are uh, making the effort that that you are. Uh, the context for me, um, uh, uh, let me give you the political context. I live in Minnesota, as I said. I went out to the um, Nina Turner for Congress campaign. I volunteered out there for three months to help her uh, in an effort to help her get elected, but but. Uh, uh, the main reason I went was to get her uh, to adopt uh, the job guarantee as her signature issue. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know Nina, she, you know she's very charismatic. Um, she had a good chance to win. Uh, she didn't, but had she, I didn't want the narrative coming out of that campaign that she won because she's a charismatic figure. She's Nina Turner. I wanted her to have that signature issue, um, as I said. Uh, I was a bit frustrated. One of the reasons she lost is she had a very insular campaign, um, and I won't go into that too much. But what I did, since I was away from my bookstore and away from my household and was immersed in a campaign and in politics uh, for the first time in a while, is I, I wound up uh, taking three weeks to write out the strategy, uh, uh, as I call it, I call it the blueprint. It's right here. I, I printed it up. It's called the blueprint because it's the strategy for to remake the Democratic Party and and achieve a supermajority in Congress, which is what we need uh, in order to pass a federal job guarantee. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what you have to do. So, um, uh, so I spent three weeks doing it. I got it into her hands and all of her staff's hands about three weeks before the election, which. It, you know, I wasn't I'm not naive. I didn't expect them to pivot from what they were doing and just embrace this. Um, and so when I came back to and it didn't happen, I came back to Minnesota and I said, you know, maybe I should just run myself uh, on this. And um, uh, I had run for Congress in 2004 in the state of Nevada as a protest candidate against the Iraq war and against the ban on. Uh, the constitutional amendment in Nevada to ban gay marriage. So I was a kind of a protest candidate against those two things. But I've been down down the road before. And as, as, as was indicated, I've been involved in a lot of campaigns I've campaign managed. Uh, but when I uh, the, the my con my county uh, was not included at the time in Congressional District one, which is now purple after the redistricting and after my county was included. We did not know, um, you know, I did not know until the last minute because that's how long Minnesota redistricting took to know that I was going to be included uh, in that district. And once I was, I said, well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to I'm going to run. And the 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 blueprint is three, uh, three sections, the platform, which is the job guarantee, the pay for, which is MMT, and then the playbook, which is how to run the campaign surrounding it. And I uh, let me just ask format here, because um, 
uh, from what I understand, there's, I'm going to have it dedicated like 10 minutes um, at some point, or how, how are we, how are we conducting this? Should I go further or should I wait for my turn later? I'm not hearing, I'm not hearing a response for some reason. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, Rick, uh, okay. I said, um, we will have a, a question on the pay for issue. So you'll, you'll get a chance to talk about it in, in a few minutes. But maybe the, the next question that the other candidates answered, uh, and I'll give you a chance now to, to respond to, which is, you know, how you discovered MMT and how it fits in, in your policy platform. Uh, and, and then we'll leave it at that. And then we'll come back to the pay for question and some of the other challenges uh, some of you face in the campaign, kind of the pushback on the MMT framework and all that and the inflation uh, question that we all get these days. I, I'm, uh, I've been a student of the, the history of money and the science of money for 20 years. Um, I've studied with Edgar Kahn, who started Time Dollars. Uh, I was with David Graeber. Uh, who wrote that the, five, the last 5,000 years, Charles Eisenstein, Stephen Zarlinga of the American Monetary Student um, uh, Institute, uh, William Spademan, uh, as I mentioned, I was the director of the Campaign for a Common Good Economy. I understand what a, a sovereign currency means. I understand the science of money. And, and I've worked in the kind of the alternative currency world that, that we wanted to charter a bank in the state of Massachusetts that would be democratically owned by the account, the account holders and would have a parallel sovereign currency um, that would interface with the normal, with the, you know, the, the Federal Reserve notes. Um, and and a, a, an alternative currency, uh, complementary currency where there were local currencies, they're all sovereign currencies. You decide uh, uh, what you're gonna issue and, and, and for what and, so it's the same thing as a, you know, as, as a established legal monetary system. So I understand money and I understand, you know, you know, I went down to Occupy Wall Street. I dropped everything. I was there very early in my, uh, what I advocated for was for the Occupy movement to establish its own currency. Uh, and I could go into that in some detail. Unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of uh, anarchist types, uh, uh, we didn't, didn't want anything to do with money, right? It, it, to me, it was the absolute perfect thing because we're we're trying to we're defying the the existing system, Wall Street and what have you. Hey, let's do our own currency. I think it could have been very powerful. But my point is, is I understand you know I understand money, I understand sovereign currency. So when I when I came across modern monetary theory, I, you know I studied it in depth. I, I, you know Randall Ray's book is terrific, which is kind of the textbook that I hope. Most of you have read. If you haven't read that, you want to you want to you want to read that as well. So, yeah, that's my answer. <clears throat> Wonderful. So, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and combine my other two questions so we can have enough time for you know questions from the, from the audience as well. So, uh, the theme here is: What are some of the most challenging questions or pushback issues you you get uh, on on the campaign trail when it comes to your policy proposals? How do you address them? And then combined with the big question of inflation that everybody these days is kind of using to justify austerity, to push back against climate action and social spending. How do you use the, the MMT framework to respond to this mainstream narrative uh, about inflation? Uh, and I, Stephanie uh, stepped uh, aside for a second. Uh, so Neil, uh, do you mind uh, getting us started with this, uh, with this question? Yeah, no, that's uh, that's great. I'm happy to take the stab. So for context, uh, Colorado's first congressional district in Denver is a D plus 57 district. We have one of the most progressive uh, house districts in the United States of America. And so um, I don't exactly run in to a lot of people who have necessarily a challenge uh, for advocating for policies like health care as a human right uh, for the Green New Deal. Uh, and a number of these other, you know, transformational socioeconomic policies that many of us care about. Uh, my favorite conversation, though, is to have with moderates and Republicans, uh, actually, who uh, do like to ask that question of like, well, this sounds all good. But uh, yeah, to Federal's point, you know, this is going to increase inflation. There's too much money in the economy. And I think what's really important about how we talk about MMT 
uh, is to simplify it and not necessarily uh, bombard people with like the technical academic rhetoric, but kind of lead people uh, to the truth themselves, right? And that's why I go back to the example I listed before, which is, well, you know, did we ask for how we were going to pay for it, you know, back in 2001 when we financed like the war in Afghanistan? And people oftentimes are like, oh, no. Uh, and then it comes again, 2008, the banking crisis, uh, when we melted the economy to the ground. I ask people, well, did we exactly have that cash on hand? You know, like, did we tax ahead of time to pay for these things? And I think once you start to get people to deconstruct that mentality on their own, that's really when you can come over the top and say, well, if we've had the ability uh, to pay for these things, like, why are we neglecting uh, things like healthcare as a human right? And I think what's really uh, important also is to show the economics behind healthcare, behind housing, and behind the Green New Deal, and why that as a country, if people even do care uh, about like the budget and the deficit, you know, these policies actually save us money as a nation going forward in general, right? Because, you know, the way we operate with the housing crisis now is, you know, we try to arrest our way out of the issue. We try, uh, you know, to allow police, uh, you know, emergency centers, you know, I mean, and I ask people like, look, you, you already pay for it one way or the other, right? Like every emergency trip, every jail cell that's occupied, you know, these are things that are coming out of your own budget, right? And so instead of not solving the root cause of these issues, maybe we should actually focus uh, on that for once and not kind of this uh, criminalization model uh, that really doesn't do anything uh, to solve these issues and actually cost us more money as a nation going forward. So that's how I always try uh, to kind of put that together. And I think on the concept of inflation, like this is such a great opportunity uh, to have this conversation now as well, because it is top of mind for everyone, no matter what. Um, and, you know, we're all feeling it, right? Everyone goes outside and, it, you know, we're paying more for everything right now. And inflation is a great, uh, again, like I think Fedel framed this really well, right? This is an education campaign, right? Like you're not necessarily uh, just talking about MMT. Uh, you're trying to kind of educate people on like the concepts in and of itself. And so, when I talk about inflation with people, I try to simplify it as much as I can. And I say, well, what is inflation, right? Like, what, what are we talking about here? Because in a basic framework, inflation simply means that there are too many dollars in the economy. Uh, it is challenging supply. Therefore, we should pull more money out of the economy to reduce that demand. Uh, and that is how you solve for inflation. And huh, what I try to encourage people to think about is, why do we always seem to put the burden of inflation on the working class and the middle class, right? Like why are interest rates what we hike up uh, and why do we make us pay for the things that oftentimes are triggered by corporations, the oligarchs, the most wealthy uh, individuals in the United States of America? And all I say from there is, look, like if we really need to pull dollars out of the economy, why don't we actually just tax billionaires, right? Like why don't we um close corporate loopholes actually for once you know and we have the power to do it why don't we target the wealthiest amongst us to actually favor that side of the equation and i think when people start to generally grasp the economics in and of themselves this is where our conversations are the most empowered because look i mean i think we all recognize mmt even for me and stephanie mentioned this as well it is complicated initially, I think, to put your mind around this. So if we, as policy experts, as candidates, as people who make it a priority uh, to consume this information on a day-to-day -day basis are challenged by it, then we know that the average American, we know that the voter uh, is likely not going to be able to necessarily buy into it in the same way that we are. And so I really think that simplifying the culture of MMT, leading people to the truth themselves, uh, and trying to educate in a way uh, with questions, uh, like I said, that allow them to kind of have the truth um, on their own is the best way that we can continue this movement. Because as people, I think people now are also starting to recognize some of the basic concepts of MMT, you know, by themselves. Uh, and they're asking themselves the general questions without even knowing about MMT, like, well, why are we paying a trillion dollars for a Department of Defense budget? Like, how can we can pay for that, but we can't seem to pay for these other things like this doesn't make sense. So I think 
the culture is now, right? The moment is now for this community to really elevate its impact uh, and spread the gospel because I think people have that truth kind of already. And so those are some of the things I use on my day to day uh, when we do get hit with some of those more challenging questions behind the economics uh, of socially progressive policy. Thank you. And, and it's actually interesting that this particular episode of inflation with the pandemic disruptions to supply chains and with abusive corporate power that we've we've seen clearly now take advantage of the inflation narrative to increase Absolutely. their profit margins. This is the perfect moment for for political campaigns to leverage the MMT narrative to push back against these austerity driven approaches, because to me, inflation, you know, comes from two things. One is you don't have enough productive capacity to keep up with the demand. So the mainstream approach says kill the demand instead of actually building productive capacity, creating millions of jobs to meet this, this demand. And, and this allows us to actually target the actual sources of shortages, which include health, infrastructure, energy production, housing, you know, all of the components basically of the Green New Deal. And then the second source of inflation, which most people now are beginning to recognize on a kind of uh, a public policy uh, level, is abusive market power, price setters in the system who actually take advantage, who can raise prices because we let them. And that kind of abusive market power is not going to go away by reducing spending or raising interest rates. It only goes away if you tax and regulate that abusive power out of existence. In other words, if you democratize the economy, which is where your campaigns come in, because we're talking about the 535 people whose job is to regulate and tax the abusive market power. That's Congress. That's the Senate. Are they going to bite the hands that feed them? Are they going to go after the super PACs that are actually representing this abusive market power? That's where... Uh, as as Moad said uh, earlier, taking money out of politics becomes a core democratic principle, not just for the sake of democracy, but for the sake of actually taming the sources of inflation. So putting this at the center of our push back against this, this narrative will bring uh, quite a bit of kind of neutral audience to, to this because everybody is sick and tired of the abusive power of the oligarchy. Uh, and, and for us to connect it to the issue of inflation, is going to be pivotal, I think, for 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 this movement. Um, so I'll, I'll go back to to you, Stephanie. The, uh, thanks for coming back. Um, the question I'm I'm trying to fold here two questions into one. Uh, what are some of the the challenges, pushback issues that you hear from from constituents? How do you address them? In particular, the issue of inflation today, uh, and and trying kind of to undo the mainstream narrative about inflation that's used to justify austerity and push back against climate action and social spending. Absolutely. Um, thank you for the question. And also, I just, if you can hear my dogs barking, I want to apologize. My husband just left. And so I have two puppies upstairs who are just going wild right now, but okay. Um, so yeah, a couple things that I wanted to say um, on this question. The first thing is that there is a big difference um, between myself and the person who I'm running against. Um, he comes from a very wealthy background. He's been in office for 24 years. His campaign um, is, you know, funded pretty much 100% by corporations, um, specifically the military industrial complex. And so when I'm talking to, um, you know, folks out in the community about economic policy, um, you know, whatever the situation might be, the, the, the first thing that we talk about is what's happening in our daily lives um, with regard to the economy and what we're all experiencing and going through. And I can personally speak for myself that um, it is an incredible struggle to be a working class candidate. And I, I think about the people that I talk to on a daily basis, they're also struggling making or doing multiple jobs to barely even break, uh, make ends meet, um, living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, just like me, my husband and I, and I, I, I don't say this to, um, I, I, I say this because I think it's okay to be honest about being a candidate who I can't pay my mortgage. Like my husband and I, we can't pay our mortgage right now. 
and we're late on that. And those are things that we need to talk about. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we need to be able to have open conversations about what the people in our communities are experiencing so that we can open the conversation to um, economic policies. And when I'm having these conversations, the, the thing that comes up most is um, a reframing of understanding economic policy. So when I was first reading Stephanie Kelton's book, um, what stood out to me and what made most sense to me um, was reframing economic policy from understanding our personal finances, um, that the national, um, you know, the deficit and everything at the national level reflects the, uh, like your home, your household bill. It's And understanding that that's not true um, was like a whole new, uh, just a whole new understanding for me. And so when, I, when I'm talking with communities about that, about how there's really been this narrative of, um, we can't pay for this, we can't pay for that, there's not enough for this, there's not enough for that. Um, we're already poor here in my community, you know what I'm saying? Like we don't need to hear these narratives over and over again that we can't do these things that our communities need. And so I feel that MMT has really, really helped um, you know, guide those conversations because we really need something to um, help digest the realities of what our, our government is doing. And MMT has really helped me do that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm actually really distracted by my my dogs barking. I, I, I don't know, can you all hear them? Uh, no problem, it, a little bit. I, I recognize it's probably louder on your end. But yeah, thank it's you. extremely loud. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna shut off my camera one more time. I apologize deeply, I'll be right back. It's okay. Uh, Moad, can you um, uh, address this uh, this question? Some of the pushback uh, and and how this inflation mainstream inflation narrative is used to push back against um, uh, social spending, climate action, healthcare, and, and how do you use the the MMT framework to to respond to those challenges? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like Neil said, this is the ubiquitous question we all get: is how are you going to pay for it? You know, every good thing that we want sounds great, but you know some voters are always concerned. It's you know it's going to bankrupt the country. Uh, I don't uh, I don't typically deploy like I don't ever really say you know there's a thing called modern monetary theory, but uh, it, it's the understanding that that empowers me to speak confidently, uh, and also some of the things that are discussed by MT uh, I, I talk about. But essentially, almost any policy I, I typically bring it back to just basic facts. So Medicare for all. Uh, when people tell me how are we going to afford that, I. I you know, rebut it with saying we honestly can't afford, we can't afford to not do it at this point. Um, that Medicare for all saves us a lot of money. Uh, it is going to keep us healthier. It is going to grow our economy and just kind of uh, challenging the uh, the misinformation that's out there, uh, but also uh, trying to deploy a bit of uh, re-education when it comes to uh, monetary theory and talking about how, you know, we somehow afforded uh, to uh, bail out Wall Street. We've afforded to run these huge deficits for trillion uh, dollar wars. Uh, and so we can absolutely afford to do this. There's money in Washington. It's just a matter of political will. Uh, so don't really get too much into the specifics of how MMT works. Uh, but I try to, like you said, really what needs to happen is a mass education effort. Uh, I think, I imagine the first step is going to be probably educating policymakers. Uh, and then hopefully that will start to uh, seep into the public uh, conscious uh, consciousness. But it's tough to kind of educate people on doors within a three minute conversation. So I don't, you know, get too much into the weeds there unless they're, they're you know, somebody who's deep into economic theory. Uh, but uh, I try to deploy my understanding of economic theory that I've gained through MMT with uh, with regular people and try to keep it at a basic level. But that's that's what I do for Medicare for All, Green New Deal, talk about how we absolutely need to do this and it's uh, unaffordable to not do it and that uh, we've done it for other things that have not been productive like war and uh, bailouts for, for these bankers in the financial service sector. Uh, and then uh the the second question which is uh, how do i challenge inflation uh, so i try to also bring it back to basics like neil does uh, so for me uh, i usually start off with you know describing what is inflation and it's the fact that prices are going up and really there, there's like three main reasons that could happen which is uh, there's an increased demand that supply cannot uh, and so prices are going up uh, there's some sort of issue with supply uh, and either it's decreased uh, or also once again it can't meet demand uh, or uh, there's corporate corruption, there's jack prices for no reason. Uh, and so what I tell them is that we've had all three. Uh, so we definitely had a small amount of increased demand. We injected a lot of money into the economy uh, to help people from literally starving to death. I think that's fine. We should do 
that's the case. I'm okay with that part. Now, we have uh, probably the worst disruption in supply chain, uh, in modern uh, history in the supply chain. We have a globalized supply chain like never before. Uh, and uh, this, this pandemic has thrown a huge uh, wrench into things. And so we should be doing a whole lot more to address that side of the problem and trying to uh, make our supply chain more efficient, uh, try to bring uh, productive capacity back home and not rely entirely on a global supply chain. Uh, so, so there's things that we could be doing on that end. Uh, but what I typically focus on is uh, what we could address the easiest, which is uh, corporate corruption and the fact that uh, a lot of these companies are uh, increasing their profit margins, which means that they're charging a whole lot more uh, than what it costs to make things uh, even before the pandemic uh, in that they're making a ton of money off of uh, the American people. And so uh, Congress should be taking action and swift action to address that part of inflation. And so that, that's typically how I address the inflation part and try to uh, minimize uh, the impact of actual spending and, and focus on the fact that we have huge supply chain disruption and uh, a lot of uh, corporate greed uh, setting in. Absolutely. And that's, uh, you're absolutely correct in, in the sense that your job on the campaign and all the canvassers working with you is not to do MMT lectures in, in three minutes, but really help people kind of move away from the dominant narrative and challenging the dominant narrative with, with simple questions like, what are the sources of actual inflation? Which prices are actually going up? Which corporations are dominating those industries? Why do we have shortages of specific products and then people think through kind of the logical simple process and recognize that it's that we shouldn't be blaming poor children for having received uh, support checks from the federal government during the pandemic for these actual sources of inflation so we need to address the actual source of inflation with additional capacity and better logistics and and close to home supply chains and with you know, using the power of, of Congress to go after abusers of, of, of the price system and, and the corporate sector. So, uh, Rick, uh, tell us your approach to, you know, addressing the issue of inflation and, and what you hear from your constituents and the, and the kind of this dominant narrative pushing back against social spending, climate action, because we can't pay for it because it's going to be inflationary. And you're on mute, Rick. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, I'm 65 years old. Uh, I started, my first campaign was George McGovern in 72. I was stuffing envelopes. I've been in, involved in a lot, and as I said, uh, campaign managed. The, 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 the blueprint that I'm going to come back to, I'm going to make available to all of you because it's written for you. Uh, any candidate for federal office, it's written for this purpose, uh, including hopefully uh, a candidate that's going to run for the Democratic nomination for president in, in 2024. So what uh, I've had some terrific training over the years. I've been in a lot of campaigns. And uh, so my response to this is I've uh, as part of the play, play uh, the, blu the blueprint, the platform is the job guarantee. I call it full employment plus because there are some features that I've uh, uh, added that uh, I believe are important. But um, w we have to keep it simple. Everything I do in my campaign, any question I am asked, I always pivot back to the job guarantee. So with the question of inflation, I'll just say, yeah, it's, it's horrible, isn't it? And who's getting hurt the most? Who's getting hurt the most? The people that can least afford it, the people that could benefit from a job guarantee. I'm always pivoting back. I'm not going to answer the inflation question. I don't want to deal with the framing, their framing and their issues. You cannot deal with somebody else's framing if you want to be successful. You have to control the debate. Uh, one thing I'll mention before I, I forget it, is I've rebranded MMT because MMT is not, uh, uh, it's not as, as all the economists know are in that school, modern means not what most people think modern means. It's w w when I think it was Randall Ray uh, coined the term, it, they, they meant modern by the last 2000 years. So to say modern is not the best thing to do. And theory is too uh, vague for people. So I call it best monetary practice because that's what it is. 
You understand the monetary system. This is the best monetary practice. So that's that, that's the way I put it. It is in uh, as far as um, let me let me go back to something I do say. A couple of things I do say. Uh, and and uh, does anybody know that Upton Sinclair ran for governor of California? Everybody knows who Upton Sinclair is, right? Author of The Jungle. Okay. Well, in any case, nobody knows he ran for governor because he lost. And and I'm coming to the point where you cannot educate voters and expect them to vote for you at the same time. It doesn't happen. Don't try. Upton Conclair said, you can't get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. We flip that all the way around. We flip that all the way around and say to people who would benefit from a job guarantee, which is a heck of a lot of people who are suffering from income and health insecurity, um, you can have this. And they don't care that it's, uh, you know how to pay for it uh, or that you can explain best monetary practice or anything else. They don't need to know. They need to know that you're gonna you're gonna do something for them. That's what they need to know. Uh, so that's how I deal. You know, I will talk about the same things that you pointed out as far as why we have inflation, but I don't want to. I want to pivot right back to the, and I don't. I pivot right back to you know, isn't this horrible? Look who, uh, you know, this is hurting people. And if we had a floor under the economy that a job guarantee would provide then people would be assured that they can they still have income and health security and they can ride through an inflation like this. That's the important thing. That's it thank, for, for now. For thank, me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Rick. Um, uh, we do have uh, about uh, 15, 20 minutes to, uh, to gather questions from the audience. Uh, I see there's uh, quite a bit of action in, in the chat. Um, there was a question uh, a little bit ago in the chat that I lost, but please go ahead and, and drop your questions to the candidates now that we've heard quite a bit about their approach and their and their background. But the one of the questions that came up uh, earlier that I wanted to um, put in front of you guys uh, is how do you how do you ensure that once you are in office that you be able to resist the pressures. Uh, and continue kind of holding on to these principles and, and pushing for shifting this this narrative. Uh, this is a, a question that a lot of politicians and a lot of people running for office say we, we always like them before they get into office. Once they're in their office, they go into this insular system. <laughs> and then we, number one, we can't reach them anymore. They don't hear us anymore. And all of a sudden they become part of the, the establishment more or less. So uh, it's, it's a fun question to start with. <laughs> uh, Neil, do you want to go ahead and uh, start with, uh, with this question? Yeah, sure. I mean, like, I'm happy to be brutally honest about this, which is that you shouldn't trust anyone, honestly. Like, that is, uh, you've been given every reason to distrust candidates. Obviously, the big part of that is the corporate PAC scene. But I think the important piece about running a grassroots campaign, and for context, I've never run. Uh, for office before. This is my first time ever running. Uh, and instead of trying to make it easier on myself, because I think a million people when I started exploring told me, why are you running grassroots? Why aren't you accepting corporate PAC dollars? Like, how are you going to compete uh, with a 25 year sitting multimillionaire corporate back giant? Um, I said, I didn't want to be a part of the problem that I see as being most present in national politics. And I think what's important is that once you get into office to maintain that commitment to not accepting corporate PAC money, because what won't happen when I'm elected into office is that uh, in the same way that a million corporations and the donor class uh, flood my opponent with money year after year, even if our voters feel disenchanted and disenfranchised by her leadership, I won't have that safety net, right? I won't have the resources or the influx of cash that so many corporate back politicians have year after year, like electing grassroots candidates uh, ensures that your vote, that democracy shines the brightest because uh, when it comes time to having to pull the plug, if any of us pull 
back on our promises and start engaging in the same type of behavior that all of us have been um, so upset by, uh, like I said, like I'll be done, right? And that's just kind of the way I try to articulate this to people is this is why a grassroots, this is why a people powered campaign is so important for our country right now. Uh, it ensures democracy that exists. It ensures that your vote has power. Um, and I think that's like the baseline we should be treating candidates, at least in terms of giving them our trust and legitimacy uh, on the campaign trail. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Maud, uh, uh, how do you respond to this question? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's a tricky question, to be quite honest, because uh, I get asked it all the time. It's, you know, you know we've seen put in whatever member of Congress, we saw the so and say they'll do this or something, and then they, they change. And <laughs> ultimately, I'm like, you know, I think I'm sincere. And, uh, and I hope I wouldn't change. But I, I, I like many of you, you have a lot of candidates make it in Congress. Uh, and then uh, maybe one thing that differs me from uh, other people running for Congress is I already worked in the institution, I've seen how it operates, uh, I've seen how uh, kind of the system for you become more mainstream and uh, not challenge the status quo. Uh, and uh, in, in some ways, I, I'm kind of prepared for that. Uh, I, you know, very little uh, excites me now about you know, walking the halls of Congress and say, running into uh, Bernie Sanders or AOC, it, 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 there's something that, you know, kind of brings it back down to earth after working there for a while. But uh, ultimately, like Neil said, I, I don't think that you should trust anyone just because they're telling you something. I believe in trust and verify or verify then trust. Uh, you see what they're saying uh, there are other actions and, and values uh, fully aligned with yours or um, are you seeing some missteps and, and things of that sort uh, but uh, ultimately yeah i think that we need to find ways to keep candidates uh, accountable uh, you know some folks have talked about uh, you know how dsa maybe was in place to do that but doesn't seem to be doing that a terrific job now uh, but i think that there needs to be some way to to hold uh, candidates accountable if they if they start veering off path uh, and I think there was the question also of like, how do you plan on, uh, like, you know, staying true to like this the MMT, the theory, uh, and not kind of falling to mainstream. Uh, so I, I think we just have facts in, in, in what's actually right on our side. So that makes it a whole lot easier. Uh, you know, I love it when Bernie always says something like, uh, you know, when they ask him how you got to pay for Medicare for all, he just is his rebuttal usually is like, how come you guys never asked that, you know, to, to folks with the bill and at Wall Street, like yeah, in the classic Bernie way where he's really angry. Uh, and so th that is like, you know, MMT type thinking uh, being used. Uh, and so, and typically most people agree with that. They're like, yeah, we seem to have a lot of money for other stuff. So I think finding ways to keep injecting uh, like MMT pushback to mainstream economic theory um, and, and, you know, not necessarily having the lecture, but but using the facts that we have on our side and, and uh, you know, the cognitive dissonance that is typically deployed against uh, uh, transformative policies that would benefit Americans uh, and just keep using that pushback and keep winning the conversation because I, I do think a lot of people are, are starting to catch on uh, to, uh, to to kind of the fallacy in the thinking uh, as we see more and more, you know, big corporations get bailed out or wars be being started. Uh, what I typically point towards also is like the fact that we just ended the longest war in American history, history the Afghan war, and we have the largest, back, uh, the largest military budget in U.S. history now. And so some of this stuff is like not aligned at all. It's just, they're just funding Department of Defense, but there's really very little going on, like what's happening there, guys. Uh, so, yeah, I think just keep pushing back on, on the mainstream way of thinking, and uh, and uh, and yeah, hopefully uh, we're able to make some progress. Yeah, it's interesting on, on this question because it, it is a tricky question that we get all the time, and I I always tell candidates that you know you can have the most progressive platform. In, in, in history. And in, in the last you know decade or so, we've had dozens and dozens of candidates for Medicare for all, for a Green New Deal, for all the right issues. But then when they get cornered with the question, how are you going to pay for it? They have two choices. One is to go with the MMT narrative and really explain that you can do all of these things without bankrupting the country, without uh, you know dealing with inflation, all of that. Or they end up actually compromising and going with the establishment narrative, which says we have to tax somebody or borrow from somebody in order to pay for it. And once you put taxes and borrowing on the table, now you're cornered. Now you will be convinced by the establishment that you can only tax so much. You can only borrow so much. So you have to compromise with your policy 
and end up with a very incrementalist approach to addressing climate, to addressing poverty, unemployment, homelessness, and, and now we're into the establishment. So, so I think part of the answer is if you have the MMT narrative and you can actually frame your policy solutions in that way, you don't actually have to compromise uh, with, with your policy choices, whether you're in office or, or before you get into, into office. Uh, so, uh, Rick, wh- wh- how do you how do you answer that question uh, that that many candidates get? How do you ensure that once you're in office, you'll be able to continue this work and not fall into kind of the the, the Democratic Party uh, scheduled uh, uh, you know time commitment to get on the phone and raise millions of dollars for for the party and and not spend fighting for the issues you wanted to fight for. Uh, you're on mute, uh, Rick. There you go. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, I will have proven during my campaign that I can be elected by the people, and I will be reelected by the people. I got to prove that in my campaign. You know, pro- uh, Bernie proved it was possible. The twenty-seven dollar uh, contributions. We already have the example of it. I will be running that way. And when I win, I just point to the fact that I won. The people elected me, they're going to reelect me. I don't need that money. It's that simple. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the MMT pushback, or, you know, when I talk about, I, I, you know, I only talk specifically about best monetary practice when it applies and you have to, it depends on, you know, whether you're being interviewed or what, what, what the situation is. Uh, but the, w- w- the first way I answer the pay for question, again, I'm always pivoting to the federal job guarantee because it's my objective with the blueprint to get a mandate on it, to get a mandate on the platform and get a mandate on the pay for. That's, that's my objective. And you get a mandate by winning. But the way you get a mandate on something is that's what you talk about. And then you win and then you have a mandate. So the best way I, because I'm talking about full employment, I said, you know, the only time we full employment in this country was during World War II. We were all out to win a a war on two fronts and uh, the economy was going at full bore. Well, how did it get going at full bore? Well, the, the federal government, Congress issued the money to do it where they didn't have to you know, they just did it. They just issued it. This is an historical example. It went from uh, 30% of the government spending went from 30% of the economy to 50% of the economy during the war. Uh, right now, it's at 30% again. So we got all that fiscal space. And so basically, that's what I say. Hey, we did it before. And you know what? They 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 were the people who uh, opposed the New Deal, for instance, uh, said, well, you know, it's going to cause inflation. Uh, well, it didn't. And the example in the, uh, you know, I have a, one of the uh, aspects of my federal job guarantee proposal that is part of the full employment plus part is energy savings bonds, uh, which, um, uh, you know, I talk about being on a war footing and how we had the, the war bonds. Energy savings bonds aspect, and it can take, um, I'm telling you more than maybe you know to answer the question. I want to get to it at some point. There's, uh, not only is the program to uh, offer work to the unemployed and the underemployed, but it's a national call to service for everybody to pitch in because there's more work to be done in caring for our communities, caring for the environment, and caring for each other than we have people to do it. So people can take energy savings bonds, which would be the equivalent because they're backed by the federal government of a uh, treasury bond and equivalent to war bonds in that they're purposed. Treasury bonds aren't purpose. The money winds up in Wall Street. Um, and the, the way the, um, uh, the, the bonds work is there's the baseline annual dividend, but it's increased uh, directly in relation to the, say, the energy consumption reduction of an individual's Util- own utility company. So everyone is incentivized uh, to take on uh, the, you know, the uh, effective action on climate change. 
uh, by reducing energy. And the other part of the PLUS program for, for the job guarantee, which as Chernev, uh, uh, the job guarantee book Chernerva points out, it's to be uh, jobs are to be created locally and administered locally. But in my plan, I have a, uh, what I call a federal backstop program, which is about affordable housing. It's about human habitat and natural habitat. Uh, the human habitat part is, is affordable housing to put labor towards re, uh, rehabilitating existing structures, particularly. And from a, 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 a conservation greenhouse gas uh, 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 application, um, imbi- buildings have embodied energy. You can't let buildings fall down that, have, that were, you know, terrific materials, terrific workmanship. A lot of energy went into them. Uh, replacing them costs a lot more money. So that's an embodied, embodied energy, but it's also addresses affordable housing. And the other Rick, habitat... Um, yeah. yeah, Rick, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, since, since you're talking about the job guarantee, and, and I'm watching the time because we, we need to wrap up soon, yeah. there's, there's a, a good question here for everybody. Maybe we can start with you, Rick, on the job guarantee. Uh, Joe uh, Firestone is, is asking, when, when you advocate for the job guarantee, what is the, the wage uh, that you envision? What, what sort of living wage uh, do you envision for this? And then uh, related uh, in, in a way to some of the comments we heard earlier, this is a final question I'm going to put on the board here for, for us to discuss maybe two minutes each and, and kind of closing remarks. Um, uh, do you use your campaign to sort of uh, inform constituents, but also state and local government legislators that not all the burden of spending is their responsibility, that they need to join us in calling on the federal government to do its, its part. Because once, once you understand the MMT framework at the local uh, state and local level, you realize that a lot of the burden can be you know, undone by federal spending, not necessarily by taxing local residents to pay for everything. So Rick, let's start with you, uh, the living wage, for a job guarantee and an interaction with with local and state uh, policymakers. Well, I'm a uh, I'm a, a union guy as well as a seller, and uh, mm-hmm. a union friend of mine when, uh, when I gave a speech, uh, I mentioned um, a living wage. I need to see the family sustaining wage, and what wound up doing because it's helpful for people. It's is the number you know the poor people's campaign uh, puts it at 22 but that's without any benefits so i i put it 18 dollars uh with paid health care paid child care and paid leave and that and that's what i that's what i tell people um i, I really haven't had the opportunity uh that you're mentioned really talking to officials and getting them to um you know understand best monitor practice or, or and what it can mean and that we really need to fund things from the federal government because they have the capacity to do it. They're issuers and users of the currency. We all know state and local governments have to have to their budgets like a household. Uh, and uh, they assume like else that the federal government has to do the same. But we know we know differently. Uh, but I haven't had, yet had too many opportunities to have that conversation. Uh, I, I just posted the link to the MIT Living Wage uh, database, which is available county by county across the country, so uh, everybody can take a look at it. And uh, I, I'll challenge everybody to uh, take a look at their own county and and find me a single county in this country where the uh, minimum wage is actually a living wage. So I, I tried. <laughs> there isn't a single one that I know of. Uh, Neil, no, I- uh, can you address this question? Yeah, I mean, oh, am I unmuted? Yeah, I am. Uh, I think, you know, the resource you just showed is that at minimum, it has to be somewhere over $20, right? And that depends on if you have kids, it depends on the size of your household. And so uh, I do think the $15 minimum wage is too low. I think it's time for us to start advocating for something a lot higher than that. Uh, And that's my direct answer to that question. And in response to, do you coordinate with state and local officials on, you know, letting them know that with the federal government, with the money we're able to create, you know, you can take the burden off 
uh, of state and local government to finance some of these social transformations that we're all talking about. I mean, I think that has to be uh, a mandatory conversation uh, at every step of the way, right? Because um, it is essential to take the burden off of state and local government because in Colorado, just for context, uh, we have a very restrictive taxing framework. It's called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, uh, which restricts uh, our state budget uh, like cap from like evolving with the growth of society. This was something that was determined, I think, back in the 90s. And so there's a rule in Colorado that says uh, any dollar above this threshold that is generated uh, from state tax revenue has to be reimbursed back into the hands of the public. And that means everybody gets like a 10 to $15 check in that model. And what's really challenging about that model here in Colorado is that our population is like quintupled since the 90s, right? Denver is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States of America. And ideally, as a city, as a state, your local tax dollars, your state tax dollars evolve to meet the needs of that growth so that you can invest that money into education, infrastructure, uh, healthcare, all of those things. But we are trapped uh, in this restrictive uh, tax framework that is really hurting us as a state right now. And so the value of federal investments at this moment in time could not be any more important for the state of Colorado. And in general, um, as someone who does focus on housing and homelessness a lot, uh, the framework that I've created on my website is something that is actually built hand in hand with local experts, state experts and federal experts, both here in Colorado nationwide, uh, who care about ending homelessness. And the one thing that I hear repeatedly uh, being said is that actually we do have some dollars on the table. Like there are Medicaid dollars that have been created uh, for some of the challenges that we're going through. But something that we've experienced oftentimes is that the administration of those dollars and how those dollars are regulated never see that money go from federal to state to local and directly into the hands of the community members who need it most. I think one thing as Congress people and elected officials in general, we have to start thinking about is it's not enough to just create the money anymore, right? We've got to lean into seeing where that money is being spent and how. And I think that is something that more people in elected office uh, have to start talking about because if those dollars aren't actually impacting the communities uh, that we're creating that money for, then the problems that we all face as a collective won't go away. And so that is kind of the general answer I have uh, to both of those questions. Wonderful, thank you. And Maud, you're, you're next on answering this question. And then I, I really would like to give uh, each one of you 30 seconds kind of closing statement where people can find you. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and plug the websites one more time in, uh, in the chat. But first, Maud, on, on the question of uh, living wage, in interacting with uh, state and local government policymakers in the uh, broader conversation about the role of the federal government. Yeah, uh, so uh, taking the last one first. So I, I think state, state and local policymakers have a, or can play a huge role in, in shifting, uh, you know, mainstream thinking and putting pressure on federal leaders to 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 help uh, the state and local governments out by uh, taking more of that burden from them. In Connecticut, we have a huge push to just pass Medicare for all resolutions uh, through our, uh, our local governments uh, to kind of put pressure on our federal legislators uh, so that they actually go out and co-sponsor uh, Medicare for all. And so we've seen this model work in Connecticut. It, it's uh, we're making progress uh, and we can see something similar being deployed uh, to uh, to push pressure federal leaders so that they are actually uh, uh, you know, using MMT uh, theory to actually uh, invest in in the American uh, in the American people, uh, when it comes to uh, the first question, which you got to forgive me, I have Ramadan brain. So one more time, I, I know they both answered it. The first question is about the living wage. Yes. Oh, so f a federal jobs guarantee in, in living wage. So uh, that that's exactly the answer. What what should be the wage is a living wage, and it depends on the, the area. And, and I believe that you know there there are indexes that can be used to make sure that we're uh, we're tying that uh, wage of the federal jobs guarantee to what is required to to live a livable wage so it probably look different for every area you know new york would probably have a different wage than uh, say west virginia uh, but i think it, we should absolutely make sure that the federal jobs guarantee uh, is providing a livable wage for all americans and, and the thing that's uh, really powerful is that if you start using a federal jobs guarantee uh, 
providing a living wage, it actually uh, pressures other employers to make sure they're providing a living wage, even if we don't raise the minimum wage. And so it's it's a it's a powerful way to deploy market forces uh, to make sure everyone in that area uh, would have access to a living wage uh, by creating pressure uh, on other employers. So wonderful. Well, we'll start with you, Maud, in, in terms of closing statements in, in, in less than 30 seconds. Uh, where can people find you? What can people do to help your uh, campaign? Uh, and uh, most importantly, the, the date of your uh, election, whether it's primary or actual election, so that people know uh, the time frame that we're talking about. Uh, we'll start with you, Maud. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my, my election is August 9th. That's when my primary is, one of the later primaries. I haven't mentioned at all who my opponent is, but I think that it is relevant. Uh, so I'm actually uh, running against the longest serving member of Congress without a primary in the country, uh, Representative Larson, and uh, the fifth highest recipient of corporate PAC money out of all the House Democrats. Uh, so uh, I think that this race is a race that can huge powerful message to the rest of Washington, which is if you're not going to do the work of your constituents, then people are going to challenge you and uh, now beat you because. Uh, People want to make sure that their lives are getting better and not uh, that corporations are, are getting more and more uh, rich and powerful. Uh, regarding where people can find me, it's harazi.com. It's my last name, so H R E Z I dot uh, And that's where you can find everything from social to, to biography uh, to you know YouTube pages. That stuff is up on there, and that's where you can also go to support and donate uh, if you uh, if you're inclined. Uh, but thank you everyone for joining, and, and really uh, honored to just be on this panel. Thank you. Thank you. And I put all the links to the websites one more time uh, in the chat so people can uh, directly find you. Uh, Rick, uh, tell us what can people uh, yeah. do to support your campaign? When is the uh, the actual primary um, and closing remarks? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned earlier that I decided to run when my when, when my county came into the this competitive district that was represented by by a real right wing look in. And two days after they announced the redistricting, Jim Hagedorn, the, Rep the Republican, dropped dead. And the, so now we had to have a special election to fulfill his term in advance of the normal primary, which is August 9th for, for November. So I've got a primary on May 24th, which is a, just one month from now. So I really need people to uh, pitch in, uh, go to votedevo.com and make a donation. I'm running against the very running against the former CEO of the Hormel Corporation, which is here in Minnesota, frequently accused of monopoly pricing practices. Uh, his last paycheck was eleven million dollars. I get a I get a uh, uh, a monthly small monthly pension from my union. It would take me eighteen hundred years of collecting that to equal his last paycheck. Uh, so he's got the money. We can win this, uh, but I definitely I need to raise another thirty thousand probably uh, in this last month in, in in order to be able to make the voter contacts that are that are necessary. So please uh, go to votedevote.com and make a donation. Uh, this community is my community. This MMT community. I'm so thrilled to actually be in here because. I wrote the playbook. I, I I wrote the blueprint, and I wanted. Uh, I don't know uh, how maybe I can get it to you, and you can disseminate it to anybody who wants it. Uh, I think you find it extremely cool, uh, and uh, with the pain. And uh, again, I'm really happy. Oh, and the last thing to mention: I'm doing a weekly cast. If any one of you. Uh, Join me for 30 minutes or 45 minutes. It's a professionally um, and uh, uh, contact me at Richard at votedevo.us, Richard mm -hmm. at votedevo.us, and uh, love to have you on a podcast. Yeah, and I, and I posted the links one more time for, for all the websites. And if you have anything, by the way, feel free to drop it in the chat before we close. Neil, 30 seconds. Let's uh, bring this home. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Pamela. Thank you, everybody, for the questions and for participating in this dialogue. Um, look, we're in a unique moment in the first congressional district here in Colorado. Uh, I have a one-on-one -on -one challenge going in with our current opponent of 25 years, a corporate-backed establishment, multimillionaire, centrist. Um, 
and we're operating in a district that has had progressive victories at the state and local level for the last decade. I don't need to remind you all that Colorado was one of the first cities, or I should say the first states in Denver was one of the first cities to medicinalize and recreationalize cannabis. We've ended qualified immunity here in our state uh, for law enforcement officers. We've ended the death penalty. Bernie Sanders took 2016 and 2020 decisively in Colorado. Denver, the first congressional district has been ready, long been ready to be a leading voice in the fight for a Green New Deal, for healthcare as a human right, and for housing and for all. And if you all can help support the campaign financially, that is by far the most important thing that we need in this moment in time. I am a grassroots candidate. Every dollar that we raise uh, will help us challenge the $2 million budget uh, that my opponent seems to get by clicking their finger cycle after cycle. If we let this moment go, I can assure you that Denver will see and the Democratic Party will look uh, to replace my opponent, not with a true progressive visionary, but another party backed corporate centrist. And so I encourage you all to lean into this moment. Please visit the website. It's neowaliaforcongress.com. All of my social media handles are on the website. If anyone's on TikTok, uh, I have to say it has been the most unexpected, like, surprise of how well this campaign has gone. And so check us out on social, donate to the campaign financially, uh, and, you know, you can help us make history here in the 1st Congressional District. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and thank you also to Stephanie, who wasn't able to uh, uh, continue the session with us. Uh, Rick, you have one last thing to, to add. Well, uh, Neil made an important point. We can all kind of uh, share the social media, which can help us all if we can link the social media's networks together. Absolutely. And all the social media handles are on the website. So please uh, follow and support our, our friends. Thank you again for joining us. And a, and a special thank you to uh, Hannah and Ashley for, for helping with the, uh, with the setup for this uh, platform. Uh, and for all the hardworking volunteers and, and members of the Modern Money Network for making this uh, event happen, uh, keep following uh, the, the MMT community on social media, engage with us, and, and let's keep this uh, momentum going. Thank you so much. Uh, and with this, uh, I'd, I'd like to wish you a, a wonderful uh, weekend, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.